Hello and welcome to the Applied Improvisation Network Book Club. You can see a fine array of libraries in front of us or behind us, depending on your perspective. And we'll have probably a shortest session today where we might exchange our thoughts about books. So do you each want to say hello and something about books or um, <laughs> about something else? <laughs> After you, Janie. Okay. Uh, hello, I am Jean or Jeannie. Um, both of them work and something about books. Um, I distinctly remember getting my first library card uh, when I was a kid because I grew up right near the public library here in Chicago and I was really, really excited about it. And I, I remain always really, really excited about libraries. Um, so that's, that's my uh, contribution thus far. I'm Paul Z. Jackson and was amazed and almost horrified to hear that you have permission to take 50 books from the Chicago Public Library at one time. Uh, my first library, you, you were allowed, I think, six books, and that oh. seemed like a typical number for a long time. So I, I feel very extravagant and indulgent when my um, bedside is covered in stray books, <laughs> which is pretty much the case. Uh, hi, my name is Colin Pinks, and I think there's two thoughts which have come to mind after the kind of conversations there. There's one um, uh, from a library per perspective. I'm, I'm only a mile from the uh, northern part of the British Library in Boston Spa, so it, it feels very kind of relevant. I should go and see it, even though I pass it most days on my bike. So there, you just think now, I'm, now I, I, I really have a sense of duty to actually see what's inside of the place rather than just being a massive concrete building that houses loads of stuff uh, out of the way um, uh, where we are. And the second one, now you've been talking about libraries, it reminds me of um, my, my days, particularly at university, uh, as most of us probably do, doing, of, um, of either reading about, because the two, two reasons for being at university were um, trying to remember my cranial nerves uh, and trying to, you know, when I was doing dentistry, and then the other side of kind of thinking about uh, robotics and cybernetics and, and computer graphics um, when I was doing computer science. So therefore, the, the memory of sitting in a library of trying to cram stuff into your head before certain exams is my, my probably most pertinent memories of libraries. So, yeah, all, all positive knowledge, which I've absolutely not used over these years. Uh, but that, that's life. Sure, it will come in useful in a quiz or something sometime. Absolutely. Yes. It, it he, also makes me think of, um, did we have somebody else join? <coughs> uh, yeah, he joined and left before I could admit him. Such was his speed. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll see if anyone were to return. Should we leave the games until we have uh, another book club meeting with more participants? Yes, we can leave the games or or we can decide to maybe play one at the end or uh, so yeah I think uh, play one at the end and I just um, did want to remark on these stray books I think stray books are uh, better than feral books. Um, uh, feral books can be a little aggressive sometimes and they can be hard to get to know and uh, um, I am starting a trap and release program for feral books. Um, so that. <laughs> Very kind and yep. public spirited yep. of you. Yep. Yeah, maybe we can do the book oracle later. Yes, yeah, I think the book oracle would be fun to do later. Hmm. Um, I would like to share a book related quote and get your views on it. I'm going to Put it in the chat and I'll read it as well. This is a quote from one of my favourite authors, although I haven't read any of his work for a long time, Kurt Vonnegut. He said, and I just saw this in a, the way that all information comes to us these days in a Facebook post. When I was 15, I spent a month working on an archeological dig. I was talking to one of the archeologists one day during our lunch break, and he asked those kinds of getting to know you questions you ask young people. Do you play sports? What's your favorite subject? 
And I told him, no, I don't play any sports. I do theatre. I'm in choir. I play the violin and piano. I used to take art classes. And he went, wow, that's amazing. And I said, oh, no, but I'm not any good at any of them. And he said something then that I will never forget, and which absolutely blew my mind because nobody had ever said anything like it to me before. I don't think being good at things is the point of doing them. I think you've got all these wonderful experiences with different skills and that all teaches you things and makes you an interesting person, no matter how well you do them. And that honestly changed my life because I went from a failure, someone who hadn't been talented enough at anything to excel, to someone who did things because I enjoyed them. I had been raised in such an achievement oriented environment, so inundated with the myth of talent that I thought it was only worth doing things if you could win at them. And that really struck me as being a very improvisationally related piece. Um, in my, in my uh, conceptualization of improvisation, Life Pass, the P in Life Pass stands for play to play and is contrasted with playing to win and also allows for playing to learn. So many purposes of play. And play seems to be a characteristic of the thing that's going on whenever anyone is improvising. And the idea of playing to play, which Vonnegut supports here rather than play to win, is uh, very liberating and opens up a whole way of experiencing things other than competitively. That's my offering. That's interesting because it, it it has a, a, a resonance for me, Paul, because um, I think I have that um, this kind of conversation quite a lot about my reflections on my uh, school journey, having uh, which I only then re really reflected back on when I um, got kicked out of dentistry at twenty. So I'd kind of come from school and gone in gone into that as but both of you know, but anyone listening uh, may not. And so therefore um, did that. It's only when you've kind of come off the train tracks that you then realize you were on some train tracks. And it's then kind of later on in life, um, probably the last you know, seven or eight years, getting involved in theater and improv and, and then uh, a much wider, um, wider spectrum of things is that um, a similar kind of resonance where you realize your thinking has been almost programmed through that that experience of what is what is good and what is valued and so therefore the school experience is value you know like say success and passing exams is the value rather than the uh, width of experience and breadth of experience yet exactly that point when you kind of get into various other dimensions and then where we are uh, now which is um, trying to bring those together of so you know where, where are the overlaps what's interesting What's what's a, where's a resonance? Where can you take some experience from one dimension and, and maybe uh, share it in another? Um, I think it, that's that resonates with with that experience of going. It's good to breadth uh, breadth in your experience because it's interesting rather than trying to win uh, or or in our domain often. Oh, let's go on that course so I can then go and get some. Uh, earn money by, by doing it rather than going well just go on it because it might be interesting and it might make you think slightly differently rather than thinking you've got to leverage it very directly um so it's yeah that which is which is actually something i've been doing over the last probably two years we go well it's swimming around doing different things um without any kind of sense of where it might be going i think we some of us had a conversation about emergence a couple of weeks ago and being authentic about it, you know, if you if you want to be authentic about it, it's actually you, you've got to swim around in uncertainty, and then then be authentic and go. Well, I don't know if anything's going to come out of this, and so yeah, it kind of reminds me of, of that. So yeah, really really nice. I think I read it on the same Facebook one, but it really resonates with me. So thank you for that. Yeah, there's so many things I like about this qu this quote. Um, I think in our very quantified world, we always want to know the direct um, and attributable result of something. And in reality, I think often those attributions um, are much harder to find. And because, you know, it's, you never know 
really, when an idea, when a thought, when something will be useful um, or helpful. And I like this idea that you do things for the experiences and those inform a whole way of being in the world. Um, and it also makes me think with improv where the, the permission to play that so many um, people are just afraid to experiment um, or just feel that, you know, there's not that direct um, relation or visible relation to what they do. So there's not even that kind of fun of experimentation. And we learn through play and through experimentation. And it also makes me think of how insights occur and, you know, those, those little thoughts that are wandering around and they've never met before. Um, and they're both in the same brain, but all of a sudden one meets the others like, oh, hey, I've never seen you before. And then the other goes, oh, hi. And then a new thought and a new idea emerges. And I think that those doing those different activities that fire up literally different parts of the brain, but that engage different parts of our mind, our heart, our body, that those are all those opportunities for more knowledge and more insight and more experience to occur. So, um, and as a um, as someone who has been on an archaeological dig, I highly recommend it. <laughs> Thank you. Did either of you bring something or have something in mind that you wanted to put forward? Gene is reaching for something. Yeah, there. Gene is reaching. I can, I can sense that. I'm going to play through. Carry on, Gene. I have a couple of things that I brought. One is, um, so in our, in my neighborhood, hold on, let me turn off my background. So there we go. In, uh, in my neighborhood, there are all these little libraries. So as if it wasn't good enough to have the public nearby, but uh, there are these places that people have in front of their homes and people put in books that they don't want anymore. Um, and, uh, and then you, that you no longer want anymore and about it is that things that I normally wouldn't encounter or find appear. And then oftentimes there's this beautiful serendipity. So this is um, the discovers a history of man's search to know his world and himself. And the first chapter is on time and how we came to have uh, agreed upon time and the evolution of our modern calendar and then different timekeeping devices. And time is always something that I've been very interested in just with my background in archaeology and anthropology and then historic preservation and I think um, and then also my interest in in foresight that I think it's all related and so the the ability in improv and applied improv to play with time and to intentionally move with that ability that we have to move through the past move um uh, be in the present and then look toward the future is really fun. And so this is giving me some some good game ideas that I'm developing related to time. And it's also, it's just fascinating. Um, and I'll find a good passage to read, but Colin, you can go ahead and share something and I'll find something juicy in here. Before um, you do that, can I respond to the book? Yeah. yeah. I had a look on my bookshelves today for one book maybe to bring before I settled on the Vonnegut quote. I'll show you the book that I selected. <laughs> Goes into library and, <laughs> and emerges from library. No way! <laughs> <laughs> that is so wild! I think that's... It's, absolutely extraordinary and I was looking at the bit on time and some of the other chapters and I was trying to find a reference it doesn't go it, so to prove that I didn't just pull that off the shelf based on Jeannie doing it if you look in the index you'll find that there's no reference to microprocessing or computers even so it only goes up to a certain period of time and I was trying to find it because I in my mind, I'd heard someone say they'd fallen out with someone because this book had given one of them more credit than the other. You don't happen to remember what that story was, do you? No, I don't, but now I want to know what it is. Yeah, I couldn't remember, which is another reason I didn't take the book with me, but that was my book of choice <laughs> of all the books. It's so, because interestingly, so 
Um, I mean, I have, um, as, as I noted at the beginning, I have my maximum of 50 books out um, from the mm -hmm. library. So I'll just, I'll stop, hold on one second. Um, so my actual, um, anyway, the, I have um, no shortage of books and I was thinking about which ones to uh, pull today. And I've like, I have uh, like uh, this book. And if you have the same one, this will be really weird. But um, the second yeah, choice, yeah, the um, it's the Handbook of Human Emotion, um, and it just it gives um, different different emotions and um, the kind of uh, etymology of them, or uh, how they, um, you know, whether they exist in different languages and things like that. And so, I think that's kind of that's absolutely a great source for creating games around it. Uh, but I. I just did some cleaning up last night and put some books and rearranged some. And then I just thought, oh, you know what? I'll just grab this. And so that's so strange. <laughs> that is very weird. Okay. And, well, and so what, what about that book has been interesting to you aside, um, aside from the battle between um, the, the falling out? Yeah. Well, it's, it's been on my shelf for years and I take it from house to house when I've moved without ever reading it. I've dipped in and had a look. It's one of those books that if we ever had, I don't know, some sort of international pandemic where we were forced to stay at home for months, I'd get around to reading it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's, so this, this is related to that. So this is an interesting passage. Um, for centuries, the sun's shadow remained the universal measure of time. And this was a handy measure since the simple sundial could be made anywhere by anybody without special knowledge or equipment. But the cheery boast, I count only the sunny hours inscribed on modern sundials announces the obvious limitation of the sundial for measuring time. A sundial measures the sun shadow, no sun, no shadow. A shadow clock was useful only in those parts of the world where there was lots of sunlight and then it served only when the sun was actually shining. So sundials in the UK would have been abysmally. <laughs> we do have them. Yeah, we do too. Um, but uh, I, when I was living in Hong Kong, I was at, um, I went to this really interesting uh, jazz show where as one might imagine, a lot of it was improvised, uh, improvised. And afterward, I was talking to one of the musicians and he said um, that one of the interesting facets of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, Chinese art is that there's no shadow and so that there's no sense of time. So everything is, is in the present, um, which I absolutely, um, I think about that a lot. And just that notion of the shadows and using shadow as a way to perceive time is just fascinating. So there you have it. Interesting. Um, there's a few things that that's reminded me of. Um, one, I'm just going to drop in here. Um, it, it, it did kind of remind me when you're talking about time as a thing, the uh, hundred objects that changed the world, which was uh, it's, it's a kind of pocket, uh, packets of 15 minute um, history from uh, who is it? It's um, yeah, and McGregor, who is the, um, I think the head curator at uh, whatever. I listened to it on the on the bus on going to the going to a job a few years ago, and um, just really interesting, particularly almost like almost the first twenty objects and how that then shapes the kind of stuff. So it's in you know talking about that. Thought you talked about archaeology and that kind of thing. You know what what are some of those things? So it reminded me about that. Um, and also from the conversation so far, I was I was reminded of uh, I'm in an, one of the other networks I'm in is, is a place called Liminal, so it's basically the kind of the, kind of the space in between, and I think that that's I, I kind of quite like that idea of I often kind of talk about vent you know we we sit in the um, often our role is to bring pockets of stuff together and then see what overlaps and what what happens um and you know it's it's the interfaces between things which are quite interesting um what happens when you mix two colors what happens when the water hits the uh, hits the land um what kind of interference do you get when when you do that um when communities come together 
what happens when they mix uh, and and what are circumstances so yeah it's this the space in between is an interesting complex space and i've just kind of ended up being a um um swimming around in that so it reminded me about some of those things there's i don't know if i can reach it but um hold on i'll try uh. I have my books double stacked, so. It's buried in the shelves, but I think it's understanding um, comics by Scott McCloud. I'm not positive, but he talks about the, the space in between the panels in a comic and that that's a whole, it's its whole other world of time and space and things that happen in that space. Um, and I think that is interesting related to the liminality and then also thinking about uh, improv scenes and that this, the, what the white space is between the scenes and what happens between those things as well. We'll see if I can find the book. Yeah, and, and just, just by saying those words, actually I was, I might've mentioned this series before, but um, the uh, Adventures in Music um, well, by Stuart Copeland, again on, on BBC4, so my apologies for non-UK people listening to this, but hopefully you might be able to find it in some way. He, and also he did a, uh, he did a thing, I think kind of guitar, bass and drums, so a, a, an episode on each of those things, which is uh, the first one. Um, and there's a little clip I posted, I think it was on, on uh, AIM, uh, uh, probably about 12 months ago now, about um, the drummer from Prince. So uh, I can't remember, I was gonna say Gina G, but that, that's a Eurovision entry from the UK. I don't think that's the right answer. Um, but the drummer, and he was talking to her. And it basically is a really interesting conversation about the, the spaces are as important as the beats. Yeah. And it, it seems so obvious yet, I think, Often we don't pay attention to the space and the gaps and the pause. Uh, Miles Davis talks about the notes he didn't play. Exactly. So yeah, it kind of reminds me of, of that when, when, when we're doing scenes often. Um, I, I mean, it's my complaint about lots, lots of improv, you know, it ends up being talking heads without any space in it. What about jumping these ideas from theatre and scenes to application or improvisation in other areas or aspects of the world? Does that provoke? In, in, in this context, I think it's taking those lessons that you get from experiential and then say, well, how, how would this, if you raise these points, how does that apply in a let's say an organizational context or a communications you know, context. Are you, are you leaving enough pauses? Are you leaving enough space? Um, what does it feel like when there's a pause in a, con in a conversation? When you're in meetings, are you talking all the time and not really listening? So I think it's just drawing those little things out and then planting them in the other context is are interesting questions to raise for people, I think. We're all pausing now. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, time to listen and turn taking as well. Is real world application of some of those ideas for me. Yeah. I'm trying to think of some of the shadow and time aspects. Well, I think with some of the shadow and time aspects, I, time is fascinating because on we do have some um, universally or we have some idea of agreed upon uh, structures for time. You know, a day is 24 hours, um, kind of, um, uh, a minute is 60 seconds. And, and yet within that, the experience of time can be incredibly subjective and then different organizations and different cultures can have different approaches to time and how, what is time well spent versus what is time poorly spent and, um, productivity and, you know, and so I think that it's always interesting when working with someone to kind of ask them about the time culture of their organization um, and what, 
um, and even just things related to timeliness, because in some places, you know, being on time is not polite. And then in other places, not being on time is impolite. And then, so, and then just, is there, um, I think unaccounted for time is a, is hugely important that we, as people have that. So thinking about kind of the white space between the comics, um, where what is this space where all these things happen and giving people time that's not earmarked, that's not, that they don't have to report on to themselves or to other people. Cause we all, um, we all have, I think, um, I think generally when people are kind of faced with uh, unassigned time, it can be a very challenging experience for some people because there's a, you know, I have to do something with this. Something has to be done mm -hmm. rather than just kind of pausing and being there in that little space between and seeing what's there. I read a book a long time ago about creativity. I can't remember who it was. But the first phase was germination. Mm. Just do nothing. Yeah. <laughs> See what happens. That, that is important time. There's a good, um, I can find it, but there was an interesting study that was um, a, a study on creativity. And they asked, if I'm remembering it correctly, they asked participants to come up for a use, uh, like uses for a button. And then they were invited to uh, go out for a walk and kind of reflect on um, the uses for the button and then come back and uh, come up with more uses for the button. And generally the people who had no space, um, so just kept thinking button, 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 um, they came up with fewer ideas for the button, but those who had some space and then also a contemplative walk came up with better button ideas. I, I can think of no uses for a button at all since the <laughs> invention of the zip. Yeah. Are there still some? No, oh. no, it's um, buttons are so last century. Yes. Colin, did you did you bring something or have something you yes, wanted to I, it, it, share it's in the book club? The kind of the end point of the of a little piece I've done is is kind of where we've ended up, which is actually you kind of talked about. Um, attention management and cognitive load and, and those kind of things. So uh, I'll kind of ramp back to then back, arrive at back uh, that space. Um, the one thing I've been kind of reading, because I, I, I did a, another one of the things we were talking about, kind of random things to go and do through a relationship and, and, and whatever, um, was th this book, which I think it, you can see it the right way. Can you see the text the right way around? Not, yep. the, not the author. Oh, uh, it disappeared. I know. Let me just upgrade. Okay, so I'll read the author so you can hear it. So it's, it's upgrade. So it's Richard Boston and Karen Ellis. There you go. There we go. So essentially, this is it's a it's a book about um, adult development, and so the idea of um, I think. The idea that rather than trying to build um, more capabilities, uh, and the analogy being to um, fill the glass with water, how can we increase the size of the glass? So, from a human perspective, so I think it's you know horizontal versus ver vertical development is is the expression, and so adult development is a way to what what are some of the ways to increase the size of the glass? And so essentially, it 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 talks about four kind of capabilities to um, grow, uh, which is uh, sense making, perspective shifting, self relating and opposable thinking. And so like many of these kind of things, it's a bit of a process to go, well, where are you at the moment? There are some attributes of, of what you can do. How do you then grow those? And so this is an, uh, just kind of going through it um, at the moment. So it's the, the idea of how do we deal with you know the the world of complexity actually we need to increase our skills and increase how how do we do that and so yeah I, i've just kind of been reading that so it's just an interesting way to think about how can we do that because a lot of this these because i've done some stuff in 
um, thing called Kinevin, which is a complexity model. And also, I think I talked to you both last time about Nora Bateson and kind of warm data. So, but the interesting thing for me relating to where, where we come from is a lot of it is kind of models and shapes and kind of conversations, whereas there isn't a lot of like practicality about it. In other words, how do you go and do it? And so it's, it, what it's making me think about is what, what are the kind of practical things that we do as exercises, as, as games, or, or you know, leading people through a process, a practical experiential process that then relates back to this stuff. So how, how can we help people think about self-relating? Or how can we help people put a practical example of sense making or perspective shifting? So actually, which, uh, you know, I've, I've kind of encountered it a few years ago about, you know, in NLP, it's about if you have a conversation with someone, you kind of think about as two chairs, then you might think of a third perspective, which is almost the camera on that conversation. So, you know, sitting chair one, chair two, chair three, but then, then you kind of almost like chair four, which is, well, actually, the third chair probably has some judgments in it. So if you're an observer to a conversation, that's probably human judgment. The fourth chair is, well, what's the objective stuff happening, for example? So it's the, these kind of things, the link between uh, applied improvisation and these kind of things. Well, how can we make this more practicable? How can we make it more experiential to actually land some of this learning rather than just kind of write books about it and say, well, you should do a little bit more of this. So I think that's the, that's the link that I'm getting with this because um, I've kind of talked about notice, you know, the art of noticing a lot, which is how my stuff is developing into. So each of those four things are actually noticing the situation. So sense making is noticing the situation. Perspective shifting is noticing the place. Self-relating is noticing self and what's going on for me. And opposable thinking is noticing a position. And so, yeah, it's just been kind of reading that. So it's that kind of, that for me, the, the link uh, in between. I've got a second one, which, which funnily enough, Jeannie and I have talked about before, but that's, that's, that's the start of the 10. So yeah, it's just interesting um, to link a theory with our kind of practicality. I can relate the four dimensions that you've just described to being an expansion of the improvisational concept of being here and now, being being present in space and in time, and that there's elements of space spatial presence that you're expanding upon in that in there. So there's a model to develop, and there are infinite numbers of activities existing and yet to be created in the improvisational repertoire to bring people into more experience of here and now. There's, um, I can, there was a conference here a few years ago about um, kind of the neuro, um, the neuroscience of place and how the, the place that we're in shapes us and then how we shape the place that we're in where it becomes this almost feedback loop um, with it and it's, It's so, there's so many interesting activities to kind of create from that to get people to attune to their environment and just, yeah, those simple things of, we're, we're so good and so bad at noticing <laughs> at the same time, like we have these incredible abilities to notice things, but then I think sometimes just because noticing can be challenging, we, we can also tune them out incredibly well as well. And, um, and yeah, I, I will send that list of the, the results of that conference, um, not the results, but the reading list from that conference, I'd put one together, um, but I will happily share those. Yeah, so, so as, as I was, I was just talking through that, just to get, give it um, the second bit of value is, so therefore that kind of got me thinking into, like you say, attention management and and cognitive load because actually to go to your point Jeannie it's like well it's because we've got this extra load that we find it more difficult to notice which is going back to the, the walking walking around the block to actually get um open ourselves up to understanding what a button can do for us 
similar kind of thing, which then led, led me on to the thing. And uh, th th this will make you laugh, Jeannie, obviously, because we've talked about this one before, um, which is um, this, um, which is, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so Future Shock by Alvin Topfley, exactly. Uh, we, which strangely, Jeannie and I kind of made a promise to each other to go and read it and then talk about it. And probably yeah. neither of us have managed to do it because of stuff. Yes, yes. That's right. We'll but, read it uh, in the future. It yeah, the shock. future isn't here yet. <laughs> That's right. But I think it's, um, I, I, I got this from, a, you know, somewhere because I, I found a quote from him to do in an in innovation um, presentation I did a couple of years ago about the idea of the skill going forward is the ability to unlearn rather than only learn. And so that ability to, can we let things go? And, but thing is, the interesting thing is this was written in 1973 and you just read some of it now and you're just going, this is so massively relevant about uh, our, our world once again. So in some ways, everything has changed and nothing has changed. Um, in I, so I, I would be very it. interested in how that does stand up. Um, I read a, a book, um, what's it called? I'd have to look this one up as well. Neil Frude, F-R-U-D-E, who I interviewed when I was a journalist and he'd written a book about the future. And I reread that a couple of months ago to see how much of it was pertinent and it was sort of 60 to 70 percent there not in specific predictions but in trends and ideas and concepts that were still very much on our agenda uh, intimate machines i think it was called intimate machines that makes me think of um well the unintentional time capsule books where they're books that had a profound uh, impact or that resonated at a certain time in life and then going back to those and sometimes they're still incredibly mm. relevant and resonant and then other times it's um, kind of a well that was a that was awkward that that meant something to me today's book club meeting is for books you were disappointed to reread <laughs> books that continue to disappoint next time yeah. well, that were dreadful first time around and are still dreadful second time <laughs> well, I, yeah, I've gone through periods where I, um, there were certain authors that will remain nameless who I, I don't like their work. And I don't know why, but I would go on a bender and read everything that they wrote. Um, I don't know why, but um, it'd just, be to make sure. just to make sure. Um, it'd be interesting to do kind of an intentional time capsule of just picking a book for like, let's just, let's say now, and then going back in five years and then in 10 years and then in 15 years, uh, just to kind of see um, how the relationship to the text changes. So rather than the unintentional or serendipitous, but putting some thought, like what's a book that you would like to move from place to place and travel with, um, you know, is it the discoverers or, um, yeah. And then also it'd be interesting to have people list the books that they've moved um, that they haven't yet read and how many times those books have moved. What would you like to do now? Well, we could play a, uh, a round of book oracle or we could go to the, uh, the second layer of books because I'm sure we all brought um, another, like the speed round of the second level. So I'm up for either. Let, let's do um, a, an oracle of variation and bring okay. the second, second layer of books to another book club. Okay. Um, okay. So have either of you played the book Oracle before? I've played mm -hmm. variations of it, yes. Okay, great. So, um, so the book Oracle is simply, um, you know, using the books that we all have around or that many of us have around us uh, as a way to kind of get ideas, inspiration and insight. And so the way it works is that you just simply uh, call to mind a question. And ideally it's a question that is something that you are genuinely um, curious about um, and not necessarily like oh, 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 that, that type of question. <laughs> but, and then um, you uh, go ahead and state the question aloud and then say a color and a number. And I'm gonna turn off my uh, background uh, 
And then I will go to the uh, shelf and find a corresponding um, book with, a, with the color. And then I'll uh, read a passage from the number and we'll see what insights occur from, from that. So. Do you have a question in mind, Colin? Uh, no, no, if you have one uh, in your brain at the moment, say it, Paul, because I was just kind of ruminating. Hmm. It, uh, here, here's a, once we have a vaccine, what's the first thing we could do? What's the most important thing we could do? And a color and a number. I will go with green and... Okay. 46. Okay. All right. Uh, so uh, green and 46, this might be a bit more in the teal family, but it's from uh, your best year ever uh, with Michael High um, and uh, 46. 46. 46. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and it's uh, avoiding the trap of limiting beliefs. Um, oh, this is interesting. So it's uh, the whole page is about uh, Martin Luther King's um, speech where he um, improvised the section of I have a dream. Um, so uh, King's organizing and protest work continued in the late 50s and early 60s with sit-ins and protests culminating in the events of 1963. That, King, that April, King was arrested in Birmingham for disobeying a ban on demonstrations. When he was under fire from local ministers, he responded with one of his most important and memorable works, letters from Birmingham jail. A few months later, he led the March on Washington attended by over 200,000 people. It was the 100th anniversary of Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation and King, King gave his stirring, I have a dream speech from the, the Lincoln Memorial. The demonstration denies nationwide support for civil rights. Earlier that summer, President John F. Kennedy had introduced the nation's most sweeping civil rights legislation to date. And the end of the march and King's advocacy was instrumental in its passage in 1964. If that wasn't enough, time picked King as its person of the year. The Nobel Committee made him the youngest ever recipient of the Peace Prize. There was more work to be done, but he'd already turned the world upside down. He was just 53 years old. What was his secret? Avoiding the trap of limiting beliefs. King's crit critics in Birmingham thought his actions were unwise and untimely, that they violated common sense. But unlike King, these ministers were laboring under a limiting belief. They held an idea about a world that limited their range of possibilities. Instead of seeing King's actions as paving the way for change, they saw them as counterproductive. They worried that his actions would cause them to lose ground. This is just one of a billion of, of examples in love. Common sense is simply another way of saying widely held misunderstanding. So any thoughts or insights that come to mind about an important thing to be done after the pandemic? The, the, the sentence that stood out for me personally, while it's stretched out my head, is that one there, which I'm gonna put in the chat, which is, um, I heard the one that stood out as you were speaking was turn the world upside down. Yeah. Um, which, like I say, it's, it's a nice fuzzy one because we can make whatever meaning we'd, it personally we'd like for it. But I think that's the, that's the one to um, try and turn the world upside down and think, well, actually, what does your world want to be like when yeah. we can, when we have the option to do all the things that we can do? What do you, how are you going to take those choices? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I think in some ways the, well, in many ways, the pandemic has uh, exposed how terrible so many aspects of what was considered normal um, was and are. And so that, yeah, that turned that world upside down and um, figure out ways to change it for the better. It strikes me that the world is more jumbled and mixed up than it was so if there's a time scale for turning it upside down some of the upside downing has already begun and maybe a few more nudges and pushes would continue that yeah. that 
metaphorical process. Yeah. It's a good time for reflection and reevaluation and making fresh choices because the old ones were removed and they might now be put back on the table with a vaccine that we can, yeah. oh, we'll, let's just go back to how it all was, which would seem to miss some of the opportunity that's been presented. Yeah. Yeah. That the, the world suddenly realized that it was improvising it always had been and always will be, but a lot of people haven't noticed it, haven't come to their attention, as you might say, Colin. And then it did come to their attention because it was very apparent that plans had changed, no longer served. Hmm. Yeah. Did you have a question, Jeannie? I, I really don't have one. Yeah, um, let's see, what, what's my question? Um, To, I guess to build on the um, to build on uh, the to frame Colin uh, the inspired by Colin's questions, but slightly what is uh, what's important now? Um, Can you repeat that? Because it froze. Yeah. Uh, what is an important thing to focus on uh, now, and now being like the next three months? For you, yeah. For me, uh, okay. Color and uh, uh, yellow, and then one thirty. Yellow and one thirty. Seven. One thirty-seven. I'll see if I can find a yellow book. I mean, with all those volumes in your library, one would hope. <laughs> <laughs> yellow enough. Oh, that's funny. Uh, negotiating for dummies. <laughs> negotiating for dummies. Yeah. There's a fine series of books from which I have learned many a thing. Yep. And the page numbers are very large. I'm going to do I just read anything from here. Yeah, you can read anything on the page that seems relevant. Okay, I'm going to read a, a paragraph under the uh, subheading that's in a box on the page. And the, the subheading is how big is how big's your pocket? How big is your pocket? I wish I could say that I always eliminated the confusions that occur when vague terms are used. The truth is that people don't always have time to do so. Sometimes you just want to get out of a conversational situation and the last thing you want to do is prolong things by making absolutely sure that you have all the details correct. Other times being specific just doesn't seem that important. Interesting. Um... So what, what comes to mind is that um, I clearly have uh, a challenge, I'm challenged by explaining to some people what I do um, because I do a lot of things and to some uh, people, they, they seem to lack uh, cohesion or it, it doesn't, they don't seem to relate. But um, I find that I can find relationships between just about anything. Um, and, and put together kind of a cohesive story. And so what I've, what I've been thinking about lately with that is when the questions then, when people ask for clarification about what I do or that something doesn't make sense, it, it helps me understand their um, uncertainty. So what are the things that I need to make clear about it that's relevant to what they, um, you know, so what, how can I make my vagueness specific to, in a way that will make sense to them? Um, so, because some uh, doing work that I find interesting, rewarding, and that makes a better place isn't, uh, isn't uh, uh, it's too vague. So, yeah. 
Mm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Should we close with uh, just a quick round of uh, good use of a button? Yeah, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And at least I'll have two to go away with. Yeah. Uh, 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 my uh, good use, we have a pair of buttons, but uh, in the world of Zoom, if you don't have the fun filters, you can use them to make googly eyes. I go in like oh. that with the buttons. We're allowed a pair of them now, are we? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, and the one that came straight to mind, Paul, was um, if it has some asymmetry, as in top and bottom asymmetry, if you're having uh, if you can't make a decision, then you can basically use it as a coin and go, right, okay, I'll do that side, and that's my decision. Nice. So button decision making. Button decision making. I think you're onto a book. <laughs> Random objects to help me live in the 21st century. <laughs> I'm gonna that, that, uh, that sounds like your museum of the, uh, the <laughs> extraordinary ordinary. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and Paul would Yeah. I would say I would use it as something to balance on my head to maintain an upright posture when I'm doing too much stooping in the Zoom. And no one, if you, if you keep your head upright enough, no one could actually see the button. That will be a mystery for them all. <laughs> <laughs> that last Zoom call, Paul's posture was amazing. <laughs> how does he? How does he do that? Was that a button on his head, or was that a Zoom background? <laughs> I'm going to end the recording. <laughs>